transmission via YouTube. Okay, then, yeah, welcome everyone to the weekly colloquium of the Physics Institute of the UNAM in Cuernavaca, in Mexico. Our guest today is Dr. Dario Berciu from the Donostia International Physics Center in uh, San Sebastian in Spain. Let me some few words on his vita. Dr. Bercio uh, did his PhD in 2005 at the University of Naples in Italy. And he did then several postdocs in Germany at the universities of Regensburg, Freiburg, and Berlin. And uh, since 2019, he is uh, Iker Baske Research Associate at the Donostia International Physics Center in San Sebastian, where he is leading the mesoscopic electrons and photons system group. Yeah, his main scientific interests are graphene, carbon nanotubes, topological matter, spintronics, light matter interaction, pseudospin one systems, excitonic insulators, mesoscopic superconductivity, electronic and photonic quantum simulators, and money body interactions. Yeah, he has published more than 60 papers, which led to about 2,000 publications. And yeah, Dario, thank you very much for joining us at least virtually today, and we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Thomas, for the introduction, and thank you to all the people that are listening from all around the world. Well, as Thomas mentioned, uh, I'm based in San Sebastian, that is this city that you can see in the picture here in the bottom, where there is this wonderful bay with this uh, double sort of double slit, it's a sort of living double slit experiment where you can do interference with waves uh, constantly all the day long. So, and what is beautiful about this, this place is that you can walk at institute without problem of traffic. Uh, at least in my case, and the institute is located in, here in this south, this uh, western part of the city, 10 minutes away from this uh, beautiful beach of Andareta. So before to go into the details of, of my presentation, let, let me give you a very brief overview of the activity that we carry on in the MAPS group. So uh, we, have, we, have a, uh, we have a few postdocs and a few uh, PhDs that are working, uh, that they collaborate with me. And a few of them are working on, on topological lattice systems. So, and for this, we have in mind both uh, electronic system and photonic systems. And uh, this year we started a new activity with a master's students that is related to non-Hermitian physics. A new PhD that started this year is uh, completing a project with uh, a colleague from, from, from Lyon, where we are trying to, to simulate a, a, a topo synthetic topological matter with 1D uh, photonic wave guides. So the idea is that we can study uh, higher dimensional problems with uh, just 1D wave guides. And we're going soon to, to close this project. And soon, then later on, uh, uh, MIN will move to work more in more physics. And then, then we do also some research activity related to graphene. When at the moment, we are focusing on PN junctions. And the activity is done in collaboration with uh, uh, Alessandro De Martino in London. Un poco feo aquí and, uh, and Diego Frustaia in Sevilla, that is also collaborating with us uh, for the activity that I'm going to present in this talk that is related to the transport in quantum networks, uh, where basically we are focusing on studying the transport, the, the, uh, the, the evolution of charge and spin uh, in cold spaces. Uh. So after this uh, very brief introduction to uh, part of the activity that uh, are of interest for us uh, here in, in the group that I'm leading, let's move directly to what is the focus of this, uh, or part of the focus of this uh, last part here. So the idea is that we want to study systems that are mesoscopic rings that are connected to contacts, uh, uh, microscopic contacts, and we want to study the transport of uh, charge and especially spins in this type of mesoscopic conductors. Knowing that uh, 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 the, the carriers that are moving along the two, uh, the two arms of this, uh, of this ring uh, will eventually interfere before to, when they're moving from the left to the right contact. But then we also, also want to manipulate uh, the, the, this, uh, the, the, the spin degree of freedom. And we want to do this uh, either by using a, a, a spin orbit interaction that can be either of a Rashford or the rest of style type, or we can also want to consider the possibility that there is a, an in-plane uh, Zeeman orbital term that, that will basically interact with the Rashba or the Dressel house type of interaction. So how can we approach the problem? Well, we know that there are many recipes on the market. Uh, probably the, the easiest to use is to do finite size tight binding. So you, you take your ring 
you, you make a mesh, you make a discretization, and then you use a solver for, a, for finding a, the, the transport properties by, by studying this, the, this, this tight binding system. But this can be very demanding, especially if we, if we start to work in the presence of disorder. So we are looking for uh, methods that are alternative, and somehow can give us a faster solution uh, before to go to do more time-consuming uh, uh, approaches that could be based on type binding. And, and the idea, for example, in the case of Ring, is to go to look a little bit back to what uh, the, in, in the ancient time we were doing in order to, to find, for example, the values of pi, of pi the, 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 the 3.14 uh, constant. So one idea, that, one idea that was developed in the past before that there was that brilliant idea to do calculate pi with an integral, the easiest way to, approaching, to approach pi was to consider regular polygons that are uh, inscripted inside or outside of, of, the, of the circumference that, that we can use to extract pi. And we want to use a similar approach for studying the, the transport properties of, of rings. And how we want to do it, we don't want to do it with, with tight banding, but we want to do something that it's easier. So we want to forget about uh, uh, all the complexity of, that can have a ring, for example, due to the confinement or, or other factor. And we want to focus on something that is very simple. And in order to do this, we use uh, an approach that uh, takes the name of quantum, net so, ne quantum networks approach, or also sometimes in the, in the literature is called quantum graph. Basically, it's something that comes from mathematics where graph theory is well developed, but uh, on a graph, we, 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 we put on top a sort of differential operator that makes this graph uh, from a purely mathematical object, uh, a quantum object. So, and the idea is that we have a, a set of bonds uh, that, are, uh, our, that are like quantum wires that are connecting to each other via vertices. And uh, via uh, bonds and vertices, we can study the most, uh, uh, a very large variety of system. We can study periodic system, quasi-periodic, random, fractals, and so on, so on, and so on and so forth. But how can we do it in reality? So we can assign to each one of the bond uh, in Hamiltonian, that would be, for example, uh, the Hamiltonian for a, for a one-dimensional quantum wire with the spin orbit interaction, uh, with magnetic field, and so on and so forth. And then we are solving the, uh, the Schrodinger problem for each one of the bonds. And uh, for example, we can, solve, we, we can solve the problem with the Dirichlet boundary condition. So the wave function will be fixed at the two extrema of the bond. And then we can find uh, uh, the, the, the final Hamiltonian of the full uh, network by requiring the continuity of the, the wave function in all the vertices and doing the same game also with the probability current. Once we have done this, uh, this, this, uh, this almost uh, easy work, we can find uh, uh, an Hamiltonian that is valid for the full network. And as a consequence, then we'll have uh, our wave function for the full network. And this allows us to find, for example, the spectral property of uh, uh, an isolated network, or for example, an isolated ring. So to give you an example where uh, we have uh, what was mentioned in the, in the title, so in a billion and in a billion uh, gauge field, let's take the case in which uh, each single quantum wire of our network is containing a, a, a magnetic field, an orbital component of the magnetic field, that is this uh, QA term that we're adding to the, uh, to the, to the momentum. And then there is also spin orbit coupling. So this, uh, this, uh, this part here will correspond to an abelian uh, gauge field because we'll be just a, a, a complex uh, number that we add uh, to, to our wave function. While uh, the spin orbit coupling will result in an abelian contribution to our spin orbit coupling. It's non abelian because it will be a, a sort of matrix. So it means that it will be non, non commutative. So we can now find for a single quantum wire, so for a single uh, uh, um, age of our network, the corresponding wave function with the Dirichlet boundary condition that are encoded into this Psi A and Psi B spinor. And we see that uh, now uh, the wave function that is satisfying this, uh, this Hamiltonian up here is containing various pieces. The most important, there is a, a, this phase factor that is uh, depending on the, on, the, on the abelian part, so on the orbital magnetic field. Then we have this second term here that is accounting for the spin orbit coupling. So basically, we have something that will give us a, a flux and something else that will account for the spin precession of the electrons. And then all the condition for uh, uh, the, the continuity of the wave function in all the vertices and also of the probability current results in, in, in a set of, uh, of um, 
equations for, the, for these two component spinal, psi i and psi b, psi b, beta, sorry, psi alpha and psi beta, that where now this uh, m alpha alpha or m alpha beta are, can be obtained analytically and have this, this expression down here. Okay, but we want to do more than simply finding the, the spectral properties. We want to find the transport properties. So assuming that the system, uh, that the transport through the system can be uh, ballistic, we can simply connect uh, reservoirs to our network. And then we simply, we need to account for, uh, uh, for incoming uh, waves or electrons coming from the left here and outgoing electrons going, uh, going out from the system to the right. And in principle, we should also do the, the, the other way around. And if we do this, uh, simply we need to complement uh, uh, our system with a set of uh, uh, leads that are describing the, the left lead uh, where we are injecting plane waves uh, that can be eventually reflected. Uh, and that we are assuming that the reflection is uh, spin resolved. And the same we do for the outgoing lead where we will have an outgoing wave where, where we have a transmission that can be spin resolved. So now simply we need to add the, the continuity of, of the wave function and of the probability current in, in the vertices where we have added the, the, the leads. And this corresponds to this additional uh, uh, boundary condition. And, and now what is nice about this is that uh, for the spectral problem, in principle, the problem reduces like uh, the problem of uh, a particle in a very complex box where we have to solve numerically the, the, the spectral uh, function, the spectral equation. Well, once we add the uh, uh, contacts, the problems get well defined, and we have a set of equations that uh, admit a unique solution for the transmission and the reflection. And this is nice because this means that in this way, we can simply obtain directly the transmission and the reflection through the, the, the network. And clearly, the, the transmission and the reflection are unitary. So we are conserving the, the probability current overall. And assuming a lambda approach, we can calculate the current and the conductance of the system. So uh, that uh, said this, uh, how, how we want to approach the transport through uh, polygons. So as I said, uh, the first approach that we want to do is very simple. We want to approximate a polygon with a set of regular, uh, sorry, we want to approach, uh, a, we want to study a ring uh, with a set of uh, uh, regular polygons, for example, a square, an hexagon, uh, an octagon, and so on and so forth. And we take all, always uh, a regular polygons that are uh, even uh, in the number of sides, simply because we want to have a, a situation in which we are symmetric uh, and we are assuming to uh, add uh, uh, an incoming contact uh, in A and outgoing one in B. And then we want to complement uh, our network uh, with, uh, with uh, a phase that accounts for the spin orbit coupling. So this, uh, this non-abelian phase will read like a term like this. Uh, yeah, there is a bracket too much. And then simply we can account for the phase that we are gaining moving along each one of the upper part of this polygon. And those are the phases. So this is the last one, the previous one up to the first one from one and two. And then we sum up the one that we go on the lower path. So we got a sort of first order uh, evaluation of the transmission to the system, just calculating the overall phase uh, that we gain moving along the upper part of the lower part of the polygon. And then once we have this, uh, this, this expression for gamma, we can, we can estimate the transmission simply doing the, tra the trace of this, uh, of this product of those, two, of those two matrices. And for example, for the case of, oh, oops, for the case of the square, we'll find that the transmission as a maximum of two and a minimum of zero, where actually there is complete destructive interference and then it's growing again. But what we see is that there is a sort of a, a non adiabaticity So the, the, the system is periodic, but there is always a sort of larger periodicity when this uh, value that is uh, the dimensionless uh, spin orbit coupling is equal to the number of, of, of vertices we have in our network. If we move to the case of an hexagon, we see that this uh, flat region moves to six. And if we move to eight, we, we don't see it, but it's, it's actually the flat part is here at eight and so on and so forth up to have a very large number of vertices for our regular polygon, let's say 100. And clearly this, uh, this, uh, this flat part is simply moved to, to the corresponding 100. And we recover a, a transmission function that is uh, uh, regular and, uh, and uh, additionally is going to what is called the adiabatic limit. Means that uh, this zero here for the transmission function 
follow uh, an estimation that can be done for, uh, for solving uh, analytically the problem of the ring uh, that is going like this, where this n here is the number of the zero. And now if we calculate the full transmission through the system with the quantum network approach, uh, the first thing is that we discover is that uh, the transmission, instead of being equal to two, will get a, a, a smaller value simply because we, we account for multiple interference and the eventually particles that are reflected. But what we observe is that this trend that there is a, a, a this, this large flat part in the, the in the transmission part, the transmission function is also going into the conductance of the system. And that there is this shift of the zero of the first zero of the transmission that uh, for the square is equal to two pi. But uh, as soon as we increase the number of vertices of, of our network, this goes to this other value here that is the one that is predicted by this expression here. So now we can do the same game, not only by playing with the spin orbit interaction, that is our non-abelian uh, gauge field, but we can play with, uh, with, with the orbital magnetic field. So basically we can play with, uh, with the so-called Arnold Bohm effect that comes from the, from the abelian uh, gauge field, that is our magnetic field. And then we have uh, the arnold kasher effect, that is one that is going with the uh, non-abelian part that comes from the spin orbit coupling. So now this is the, this is the conductance for a square when we, as a function of, of the flux through the system and the, the spin orbit interaction. So we see that in the case of the abelian uh, gauge field, so the, the magnetic, the flux, uh, we see that uh, everything is periodic and beautiful. While when we go, uh, when we look what is happening when we have uh, uh, the spin orbit coupling, we see that there is again this large plateau. So it's still beautiful, but uh, the, the difference is that we observe that there is this large plateau that was present also in the, in the cuts we have seen in the previous slides. And as we increase the number of vertices, we see that this plateau is moving from two that was here to three. And no surprise when we go to the octagon moves to four and so on and so forth. And clearly when we move to the ring, this is completely uh, 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 lost because the, this plateau will be to a very large number that corresponds to the number of vertices that we're using for simulating the ring. So this is not just a, a, for fun, is that uh, in the group of Jan Sakonita in Sendai, they were running experiment for studying the, the conductance through uh, an array of rings in the presence of spin orbit interaction and uh, an orbital magnetic field. And the beauty of this experiment is that they were not using a single isolated ring, but they, they, they were able to build up an array of, uh, uh, of 40, sorry, 50 times 50 rings. So we're speaking about more than 2000 rings in a grid. And the beauty of the experiment is that in this way, out of a single uh, uh, run of the experiment, it was possible already to get a sort of an ensemble average, something that we need to do as well when we do our evaluation, making an average over the injection energy. Well, experimentally, they can access this directly in a single measurement. So what they, what they were able to observe experimentally was uh, uh, the competition between the arnold bohm and the arnold walschuler spiller effect and how this was modulated by modulating the strength of the spin orbit interaction. They did more uh, that was also a sort of inspiration for us. In a, instead of just playing with a, 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 the orbital part of a magnetic field, they started to play also with, uh, with an in-plane magnetic field. And the reason of this was just to modify the geometric contribution or, or, or to modify the, 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 the geometric phase that uh, the electrons were gaining going around the ring. So they, they started to study the conductance of the system as a strength, as a function of the strength of the spin orbit coupling and uh, of the, the, the in-plane magnetic field. And they observed that there is a sort of bending of, of this interference pattern. And that th they were successfully comparing this with a perturbative solution and fully numerical solution with, uh, with tight binding approach. So what, what we tried to do together with uh, my collaborators uh, was to apply our uh, quantum networks, networks approach in order to explain what is happening here experimentally. So, but in order to do this, we need to modify slightly uh, our approach. So the idea is that now each quantum wire that will be pointing in a generic direction gamma will be subject, subjected to a, a spin orbit coupling plus an in-plane magnetic field that can be with a generic direction alpha compared to the direction of the wire. So we, for, for, an, for a single wire, we can, uh, uh, we can treat all of this uh, exactly. So means that now the Hamiltonian of the wire will, be, will contain uh, uh, 
the spin orbit interaction with the moment operator in the generic direction gamma, and uh, the magnetic field B pointing in the generic direction alpha. So now we see that uh, our Hamiltonian will contain a, 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 a non abelian a, a term, a contribution that is conserving time reversal symmetry, that is the spin orbit coupling. And another part that actually will destroy spin orbit coupling, but we can treat both of them on the, uh, with the same technique. So it means that we can uh, uh, treat this uh, as a unique uh, sort of generalized spin orbit coupling. We can write still a, a generalized spinor, where now this, uh, this, this angle here that is giving us our spinor will depend both on the spin orbit interaction that is this second part here and on the, on the in-plane magnetic field that is this first part here. But clearly, it's a little bit more tricky to, to treat uh, the, now the problem of, 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 the, of the wave function in the network, because we cannot write anymore um, an analytical solution that has, a, that has a, the Dirichlet boundary condition. Actually, we can, but uh, we need to fix uh, the, the spinor at the beginning of the wire. We need to study the full evolution of the spinor through the wire, and then we'll have the spinor on the other side. This is doable. And this we have done, and we have uh, presented the result in this uh, work last year. So and now this uh, rotation matrix here is this nasty object here that is containing various terms and this angle theta that is up here. But now, uh, simply using this machinery, we can study again uh, uh, the conductance for uh, as a function of spin orbit interaction and strength of the of the of the in-plane magnetic field. And what you see, we see is the following. So now we have the case of a square. And we see that we have again uh, uh, the, the destructive interference as a function of spin orbit coupling, as we are expecting. And this is this notice that now this is divided by two pi, so it's different compared to the previous plot. Before the the, the destructive interference was at two. Now instead we find it at one, but it's just because we are normalizing this with different units. But as a function of the magnetic field, being that this has no flux through the ring, we don't see any sort of there is a modulation of the conductance. But there is no phenomenon of destructive interference. And, and this is still the case if we increase the number of sides of our polygon. Note that we're applying the magnetic field uh, in parallel to the contact. And we're doing like this because this was the experimental condition. What we observe here is that, uh, uh, it, that there is a, a slight shift of, of the destructive interference minimum. And there is a, an appearance of a, a blob here that is given by uh, a sort of interplay between the spin orbit interaction and the Zeeman term. And uh, oops. And uh, now increasing the number of vertices, we see that those blobs are evolving in a piece of arcs that are very similar to the one that were observed experimentally. Okay? So somehow our technique is able to reproduce what are the, the experimental results. There is only one problem, and the problem is that uh, in this setup, in this experimental setup where they are working with uh, 2,000 or more rings, not all the rings have, have, have the same uh, uh, exact shape. So it means that uh, when we do this, uh, th there is disorder in the in the in the shape of not not, not disorder in the shape of the rings, uh, but there is a slight uh, a sort of disorder in the length of each ring. So it means that uh, we are we have to do uh, we need to take account of disorder in our uh, network, because uh, as we can see from this estimation just uh, at the first order, uh, seems that uh, the maxima here instead of being uh, there are there, there are two uh, local maxima and then a minimum that is completely different from what our network's result is giving us as a result, and this is true both for the case of the ring and both for the case of the square. So if really we are planning to uh, uh, approach the experimental result, we have to account for this order in our network's approach. And in order to do this, uh, how can we, uh, in order to account for, for effect of disorder, what we do is just to introduce a, a random fluctuation of the length of, of each wire that is composing our uh, uh, polygon, supposing that the, the total length of the system is kept constant. And if we do the following, if we do this, and then we do an average over several uh, random configuration of disorder, we are able to recover the experimental result. So now those are the, the conductance just for the square and the ring that are the results, the cases that are more relevant for the experimental case. Uh, looking at uh, the case of flux versus Rashba, and we see that the, there is a sort of doubling, for example, as a function of, of the flux. So for stronger uh, disorder, that is this delta L, we see that the periodicity is almost double compared to 
the case without disorder, and this is a, 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 a signature of the so-called Arnold-Schuller Spivak, Spivak uh, uh, interference effect. And the same is happening for the case of spin orbit coupling. So we go from something where the periodicity at some point for stronger disorder is doubling. But let's see in concrete the case that is uh, with the last experiment done in Nita's group. And the case is here. So again, up is the case of the square and low is the case of the ring. And clearly we see that increasing the, the disorder, especially for the case of the ring, we see that the, 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 um, the picture for the, for the conductance is resembling better what is the case that is estimated for the experiment. So we see that there is a distabling and the figures are very similar now for uh, the, the lowest order approach or the full quantum, mecha quantum mechanical approach that we have calculated. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, compared to, to the experimental case, we simply didn't focus just on the case in which the magnetic field is parallel to the direction of the contacts, but we started to, to check what is happening if we change the orientation of this magnetic field uh, to rotate it into the plane. Let's see to see if anything interesting comes out. And the results are summarized in this, in this plot here. So now this is the, the conductance uh, calculated for, uh, uh, a, a, for the strength of, of, the, of the rush bar equal to the strength of, of the in-plane magnetic field for various angles of the magnetic field. So we see that in general, this curve is very scattered. But somehow for uh, alpha equal to pi over four, so when uh, the magnetic field is parallel to one of, of the sides of the square, we see that the conductance seems to evolve in a very smooth way. So we try to understand why this is happening. And the explanation, in our opinion, can be found in this set of, of few diagrams that I'm going to show you. So in general, the, uh, the conductance through the square will be composed of the direct paths from the, the incoming contact to the outgoing contact that are just moving along the upper or, or along the lower branch, uh, low, the lower part of the, the, of the square. Or we can have the time reversed clockwise or time reversed anti-clockwise paths. So they are going all around the square in one direction or, or in the opposite direction. So and now let's look at the, how the magnetic field is pointing. The, mag the effective magnetic field due to the spin orbit interaction is pointing along the square. So in the case of the direct path, we see that it's always pointing uh, going down in the direction of the slides. Or let's say that in, it's pointing inwards for the upper part and outward for uh, the, the, the lower part of the path. While for the clockwise, it's just pointing always inward, and the anti-clockwise is always pointing outwards. So we, we see immediately that when we place a magnetic field that is parallel to one of the, of the sides, we can basically cancel this contribution, and the strength of this magnetic field is the same as the, the effective magnetic field due to Rashba. We can cancel this contribution and this other contribution. So effectively, the magnetic field is weakened or let's say that the overall magnetic field is weakened and we are decreasing the amount of spin precession. So there is only one side of this, uh, uh, of this square where uh, the electrons are precessing. While in this idea, the, the effective magnetic field is zero, so there is no precession. And this leads to this sort of smoothening of the transmission uh, of the conductance curve. But this means also that this, uh, this effect is very uh, sensitive to disorder because once we introduce disorder in our system, we immediately kill all the direct paths and all the conductance is governed by the, the time reversed uh, clockwise and anti-clockwise paths. And indeed, if we do now the same calculation in the presence of disorder, we see, all, we see that the conductance, it, it, we, when the angles of the magnetic field is pi over four, is not anymore as nice as smooth as we've seen in the case of, of, uh, of a disorder-free system. So we try to validate our networks, our quantum network network approach, uh, comparing our results with the case uh, of uh, a tight binding solver. So now yeah, I'm showing here the results for uh, uh, the so-called Arnold-Bohm, Arnold-Kasher case, so flux versus uh, spin orbit coupling. And here we see the result for the network, and we see the results for, for the tight binding. And we see that the, the conductance uh, density plots are quite uh, in agreement to each other. And the same is true when we do now the case of, of Rashba versus uh, in-plane magnetic field. So also in this case, uh, 
we were able to find a, a, a regime in which the tight binding was in a good agreement. So, and clearly a tight binding would be a many mode uh, calculations while our approach is a single mode calculation. So it seems that uh, our single mode calculation uh, it, it works reasonably well and faster compared to the more demanding tight binding approach that accounts for many modes. So recently we started to work uh, on, uh, on, uh, on a new line. And uh, instead of just considering a, a spin orbit coupling of a rush type and in plane magnetic field, we started to look what is happening if we have two complete spin orbit interaction. And specifically, we look at the role of the Rajwa spin orbit interaction that can be modulated by gates and uh, 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 a spin orbit interaction that in, in many semiconductors is intrinsic and in this due to, to, to the bulk uh, inversion asymmetry of the system that is the Dresselhaus term. So we are now dealing with the Rajba and Dresselhaus terms that are two competing uh, uh, effective magnetic field that can produce a precession of the spin. So usually the, the effective magnetic field related to the Rajba is radial and it's pointing outwards. Well, if we, we are, if we have a system with pure Dresselhaus interaction, the magnetic field is a little bit more uh, intricate uh, and sometimes it's pointing outwards and in other cases it's pointing inwards. So you can imagine that when you start to combine the two, the spin texture of the system can be very complicated. So in, in the case we have a pure uh, Rashba system, the spin will be always perpendicular to the, to the effective magnetic field. And the two spin eigenstates uh, uh, on a Fermi surface that are two rings in, in this case here for a two dimensional systems are, uh, are rotating in opposite direction. If we have a pure uh, dressed out system, because of this uh, different texture of the magnetic field, now that the spin texture will be different. And if we start to mix the two, we can, we can have a very messy system. But the beauty is that if the strength of the two spin orbit interaction are the same, somehow the spinal go back to be again spin independent and that the direction in which the, the spin are pointing is not, not anymore depending on the momentum, but is fixed. So we have a sort of a effective in-plane magnetic field that is different for, uh, well, we have a sort of in-plane magnetic field. So we started to study what is happening now at the conductance of the system where, when we are starting to work with the rush and Dresselhaus spin or with interaction. So, and, and again, we do the, the same game as we were doing before. So we consider as a first a square and hexagon and octagon up to a ring. And now clearly the results will be very depending on the orientation of, of the square or of any polygon with respect to the crystallographic axis. So if now the, uh, the square is oriented at 45 degrees with, with respect to, to, to the crystallographic axis, we observe that uh, the spectrum of, of, of the, con so the conductance of the system studied Rajba versus Dresselhaus presents a sort of checkboard pattern. Now, if we start to increase the number of sides of, of our polygon, this checkboard pattern evolved from uh, to sort something that looks like more a, a fishbone structure, okay? And here with the dashed line, I'm indicating the line along which the, the two spin orbit coupling effects are, are canceling each other. And now in the following, I'm going to try to characterize a little bit more what is happening in the various region when tuning one spin orbit interaction with respect to the other. And in order to understand what is happening, I'm going to consider a, a disconnected uh, ring, so, uh, or sorry, a disconnected polygon, so a polygon without contacts. And I'm going to study the spin inside this polygon. And especially I'm studying the spin now on the block sphere and then checking how many times uh, moving along the, 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 the closed polygon, the spin is going around the z-axis or, or if it's going or not going around the z-axis. So up here, I'm plotting the, the winding number. So this quantity that is telling us how many times we're going around the z-axis. And below, I'm plotting now the, the, this plot of the winding number that is in general on top of the conductance plots. So what we see in the case of the square is that we also for the winding number, we recover this sort of checkbone pattern. So we see that the, um, the winding number is either plus one or minus one. And on the boundary region, the, the winding number is not defined because it, the spin is making a trajectory that is uh, parallel to the z-axis. So basically it's not going around the z-axis. In this case, uh, it, this, we have a sort of phase transition going from uh, plus one to minus one winding number. And we see that this 
pattern is completely match one to one with the with the, the destructive interference that we have seen before on the checkboard pattern. If I, I'm not showing you the case of the various other polygons because the more interesting results are, are recovered for the case of the ring, and also because those two are the ones that are more interesting from the experimental point of view. And in the case of the ring, we see that there is a sort of fish pond structure also in the winding number, where we have a half a plane that is characterized by a winding number that is minus one, another half a plane that is plus one. And then there are those arcs where the winding number is changing its sign. And actually, here for the lowest part can only change it once. Well, if we go to these higher arcs, there are regions where the winding number can be higher and higher. How did we prove this? And again, this structure, this fish pond structure is going one to one on top of, of the conductance uh, plot that I have shown you in the previous slides. We have checked this winding number by looking at the evolution of the, of the spin along the block sphere. So the, 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 the A is the case of, of, the, of the square when you are moving along this, uh, this, uh, this black line here. And we see that actually we have uh, something that is winding with uh, uh, as a positive winding. Then here we are at the critical case in which we are along the, the black line. So there is no, we are, not, we are parallel to the axis. You can see from this uh, top projection. And then uh, changing more the, the spin, the, the rush term, we're entering in the region where we are reversing the winding and we see this from this trajectory here. So all, all the other panels is the same analysis that is performed for the case of the ring. So the B corresponds to this uh, and what is happening here is very similar to what is happening here for the square. And the same is for C here where we are just changing the winding of a single unit. While in the case T, we see that the, the, the evolution of, of the spin on the block sphere is more intricate. And this is because this is accounting for a winding that goes from, uh, from plus one up to minus three. So how the spin is evolving on the block sphere is more and more complex. And uh, as I mentioned before, everything is very depending on the, for the case of the square, everything is depending on how the, 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 the square is oriented with respect to the crystallographic axis of the system, because this can change the way in which the Dresselhaus term uh, works. So we have seen that when the, uh, the square is oriented 45 degrees with respect to the crystallographic axis, we have this checkboard pattern. As soon as we started to rotate it, we, this checkboard pattern is, evolved, is evolving and you will see soon an, an animation. And when we are more or less parallel to the crystallographic axis, we, we start to develop this sort of checkboard pattern that is very similar to what we have seen before for the case of the ring, we, but with the lack of these high order uh, winding numbers that here are not present. And eventually when the, the square is really parallel to the crystallographic axis, the fishbone structure is completely lost and just we have, we have positive and negative uh, uh, winding. And you see that uh, uh, this evolution is also uh, seen in the, in the conductance, uh, in the conductance density plots that evolve from this checkboard pattern to something that has only a few spots for pure rush or pure Dresselhaus case. And here we, we see a resemblance of the fishbone. And now I, I'll show you some, some, some more psychedelic image where we start from something that is uh, uh, 45 degrees with respect to the crystallographic axis, and we rotate, uh, and we see how the checkboard completely evolve into a structure that has uh, uh, just positive and negative winding. So uh, let's try to characterize a little bit more what, is, what are the phases that are, uh, and the length scales that are characterizing uh, uh, our approach. And uh, as it was in my title, I'm speaking about a billion and a billion geometric phases. And let's see uh, how this is, is important when we consider a single interferometer. So let's consider a single interferometer like this. So I don't want to consider uh, something more complex, but because I want to try to carry out some sort of semi-analytical estimation. So I have an interferometer that, that is characterized by some angle theta between uh, this uh, upper arm and this lower arm AB, so AB, uh, theta is the angle between the, the AB and the AC arrow. And now, as I told you before, uh, the interference that we can achieve here in D, considering some injection from A, is given from the phase that we gain moving uh, along the, uh, the lower path, plus the phase that we gain moving along the upper path. And then from the, 
we know that we have the starting interference when the total phase that we are gaining is equal to zero. And again, we, we can estimate uh, at the lowest order the, the transmission from this, uh, uh, from this uh, object gamma here. And, and now we can characterize this uh, R function that, that is telling us about the phase, uh, both for the case of, of the, for, for the abelian case, so when you have an Arnold bone phase, uh, and this is just uh, uh, due to some uh, vector potential associated to our uh, applied magnetic field. And we know that uh, we can obtain the structural interference always when uh, uh, the, the, the flux, the total flux di divided by the flux quantum is equal to one half. And this is true for any angle that we have between uh, the, low, the, the lower and the upper part of the interferometer. What is happening in the case of the, of the, of the non-abelian part? So in the case of the spin orbit coupling. So again, we can write that the, uh, the, this phase operator will be a matrix because it's coming from the spin orbit coupling. Sorry, here there is again the, 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 the wrong bra brackets as uh, in one of my initial slides. Again, we can do the same calculation as we have done above here. And what we discover is that we recover the structure, the structure of interference if and only if this angle here is equal to pi over two and the strength of the spin orbit coupling, the dimensionless strength is equal to pi over two. In all the other cases, we will never recover destructive interference. So this is telling us that uh, from the point of view of very simple interferometer, to work with a magnetic field or with a, with a spin orbit coupling can lead in both cases to, this, uh, to destructive interference. But for the case of spin orbit coupling, we need all, also to achieve very specific uh, uh, conditions for the interferometer. So before to move to the last few things of my talk, let, let me give you some, uh, some, uh, some important remarks about the length scales of our, our approach. Clearly, most of our results are working in the, in the so-called semi-classical limits. So we want, to have, we want to be sure that the, the, the waves inside our polygons can see the structure of the polygons. So this means that we require that the lengths, the, the Fermi wave lengths of our carriers are much short, shorter than, than the length of each side of, of the polygon. So it means that they, they are shorter than the, the perimeter of the polygon itself. And this recasts in the condition that uh, KFP is much larger than pi. Uh, same estimation can be done for the spin orbit coupling length. And now we can, uh, we can find two different regimes. A regime in which the, the spin orbit coupling length, this lambda SO, is much shorter than the length of each wire or, or, of each side of our polygon. So it means that the, the spin can do a lot of precession starting and ending in the same wire. And this, uh, uh, this is corresponds to the, to, to the condition that KSOP is much larger than P. Or we can have uh, the opposite condition in which the spin precession length is much longer than the, the, the length of, 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 of each side of our polygon. So it means that uh, when traveling along a single, a single side of the polygon, we are unable to perform a, a full spin precession. So we need to travel really along the full polygon in order to see that we are not on a polygon and not on a, a single uh, wire. And uh, for the next slide, I'm going to talk about uh, the, full, uh, uh, the full spin phase that uh, the, uh, the, the carriers are gaining moving along the, the polygon. And I'm going to divide this into the dynamic, dynamical phase and the geometrical phase. The geometrical phase we have, has been evaluated by looking at the, at the, at the Arnov Adam Anadan contribution. So it means that we, we are considering that the, the evolution of the phase can be non adiabatic. So, for example, here in this block sphere, this inner circle corresponds to the non adiabatic phase. And eventually, when the system, the, 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 the movement of the carriers on the polygon is becoming adiabatic, this Arnov Anadan phase will coincide with the, with the Berry phase. So, in general, the Arnov Anadan phase is always smaller than the Berry phase. And the dynamical phase is simply given by the evolution of the wave function due to the Hamiltonian. So now in the following, I'm going to show you uh, the global, so the total, the, dynamic, the dynamical and geometrical phase for various polygons as a, as a, as a function of the strength of the spin orbit coupling. And the result of what I'm showing you has been presented by, by my Sevilla colleague in this publication here. So what, what you can see is that uh, uh, the maximum value that can reach the, the, the full uh, phase depends on the number of sites that we have in our polygon. So here we see that we are bonding to, to pi. When we have an hexagon, we can go to four pi. 
Uh, but this is always uh, oscillating up and down between zero and this maximum value. While uh, uh, the dynamical phase can be positive or it can be zero, and we see that it's going to be zero when, uh, uh, when the, the spin orbit coupling strength is equal to four pi, or let's say n pi, where n is the number of sides of our polygon. So we see that here is around uh, uh, six, uh, 12, then there will be 18 and so on and so forth. And if we move to an octagon, it's the same story. So we see that uh, the dynamical phase is going to zero to eight, 16 and so on and so forth. While uh, the geometric phase uh, is doing, uh, can also change its sign. But the most interesting result is that if we compare now all of this with the case of the ring, we see that if we go to the limit in which chaos of P is much smaller than pi, so in which basically we are doing a, a, was one of the two limiting case for the spin precession we have seen in the previous slides. So it means that if we set ourselves to these blue regions that we have for the case of the square, the hexagon, the octagon, they look more or less all very similar to the case of the ring. So the take home message is that somehow it doesn't matter how many sides we have, if the spin orbit coupling is very small as a strength, we cannot really distinguish between uh, any of those polygons and the ring. And uh, so uh, this was the last things that uh, I'm going to show. I'm happy to take questions after all. And most of the work so far has been done by uh, Alberto and the Eusebio in Sevilla. And we have some additional work that I'm not showing you today that is related to charge in, uh, in curved space that is done by Enoa here in San Sebastian. And uh, I'm always very thankful to all the discussion that I do with Diego Frosta in Sevilla. So let, let me summarize. So I've shown you basically that the quantum graph or quantum network approach is a good alternative to uh, heavily numerical uh, uh, case, uh, methods as the tight binding discretization that is very powerful because it's multimode, but in the presence of disorder can be very uh, time consuming and uh, also energy consuming. And in principle, with this method, we can study, uh, well, I presented you results for the case of, of rings, but in principle, we can study many more uh, uh, different type of uh, mesoscopic, mesoscopic structure. And before to conclude, let me do uh, some advertisement. Uh, I, I work as an as a, as a editorial board member for a, a journal of the, of the nature portfolio that is called Communication Physics. Uh, this is a, a, an open access platform and uh, it's a journal that is going very well. So if you have worked that you are thinking to, to, to publish open access, please take into account this, uh, this journal here. And thank you all for your attention. Okay, Rario, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, are there comments, questions from the audience? Okay, there is one from Eduardo Varios. Eduardo, go ahead. Thank you for the talk. Really, really interesting this method. Yeah. And I have one question about the slide 26 that is referred to the color of the, in the, in the block the spheres, there are yes. some trajectories with colors. Yes. What is the meaning yes. of the color? Okay. Uh, um, I have to remember, uh, the plot has not been done by me, so uh, I don't remember by heart what is the, the meaning of the color. So the, 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 that is the, the, the spin evolution of the block sphere. And uh, I think somehow this is telling you how you are tra traveling around the, the polygon. And then the color is there so that you can recognize if you're going clockwise or anti-clockwise around the z-axis. Okay, so it's the... The precision. The circulation. The, the circulation. Okay. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I have a related question here to this figure D. Um, so when we yes. go to larger spin orbit uh, uh, interaction strengths, yes, um, will we see again that the um, geometric and dynamic phase that they will go through zero in the case of the ring? 
uh, in principle, yes, because again, this is a polygon, let's say that there's 100 uh, sides. So if you go to something that is of the order of 100, yes, you will see okay. it, but uh, experimentally, this is this okay. would be not relevant. So the okay. point is that uh, at some point, that uh, what you want to reach here is for very large spinoidal cutting is the so-called adiabatic limit, uh, when all your spins are inside the plane or, or, or of, the, of the ring. I see. I see. But uh, yeah, yes, in principle, you will see a structure okay. similar to the other panels. Okay. I see. Um, and then I have a short question. Maybe you mentioned it uh, in this part of your talk where you showed this cancellation of spin orbit precision, of spin precision in yes. the uh, conductance. Uh, did I understand correctly that here the strength of the magnetic field has to be the same as the strength of the spin orbit interaction? Yes, because you basically you want to cancel yeah. this small arrow here yeah. and this other small arrow there. Okay. Okay, so you and, need and both. You see that you need... this is also, yes, this is, you well, need... basically what, sorry. No, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, I, uh, I covered your voice. What you want to do uh, is to go along the diagonal line here. I see. This, yeah. this, if you want, uh, we started to look at this because uh, we, we had in mind what is happening when you have Rashba and Dresselas with the same strength. Okay, I see, yeah, yeah. But um, with the difference that now we have a, a, a B, a, a, we have a, a two, two, two terms that are uh, one that is not inducing at all uh, spin precession and one that it is. I see. I see. Um, yeah, then I have another um, um, yeah, question regarding this term of quantum graphs versus tight binding. So, mm -hmm. Um, from my understanding, this just quantum graphs, for me, it's just simple discretizations of a continuous Hamiltonian. Is it true? And, and, and tight binding is somehow a more complex discretization of a continuous Hamiltonian. So I don't know if I did not get the, the real difference between these no, two. No, I, I would say that uh, my, my, way of my way of looking at this is the following. If you do, uh, usually when you do tight binding, you have in mind something that is similar to, 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 to an atomic lattice. So you have your orbitals and the overlap of the orbitals. Okay. Yeah. When you do quantum networks, you're doing uh, the, the, the opposite approach. So you forget about that you have orbitals, but you describe what is happening in the middle. So if you want, uh, you, you would, in the, in, the, in, the, in the simplest ways, you, you would describe a wire as just uh, the beginning of, and the end of your wire, and you place your two orbitals, and then you have uh, the overlap that is your hopping term. Do you agree with me? Mm -hmm. And this is this would be your simple state binding approach. What you do with the quantum network is, is the opposite. You are just describing what is happening in the wire and you forget about the beginning and the end. So what you assume in the beginning and in the end is just the continuity of uh, the wave function and of the probability current. I see. And uh, being that we are already at this slide, uh, let me mention that uh, in principle, it, when you play with the conservation of the probability current, you can require that simply that is that the sum is going to zero. So it's a sort of Kirchhoff's law. Mm -hmm. And this is what we do normally. But now we are playing with this lambda term here in order to simulate many mode, uh, uh, sort of mode matching problem. Because uh, we are studying now what is happening when we move from a, a, a ring to an ellipse and clearly this is important because a ring has a constant curvature while an ellipse is not and uh, the behavior of a wave function a system with the non-constant curvature is very different from a system with curv constant curvature and we are encoding all of this inside the, this uh these lambda functions down here i see i see Ah, okay, thank you for clarifying this point. I understand now the difference. Um, okay, are there, are there further comments, questions from the audience? Yeah, Eduardo, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. 
so now I have another question uh, yes, after me. your explanation. So when you have these different shapes between the vertices, well, uh, you change you change the the face be in between the coupling. Okay, so they imagine that when you have a an square, the the face the different face between the two uh, lines is different. When you have, for example, an hexagon, are you consider that in the in your model? The quantum Oh, well, uh, I, somehow it's all in, uh, let, let's see if I understand well uh, uh, your question down. So, well, the idea is that uh, now when you are in a single wire, the spin is processing because uh, and now it's processing around a, 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 a magnetic field that is fixed by the, the spin direction, the, the wire direction. Yeah. Now, every time you have a, a connection, a square, an hexagon, and so on and so forth, you will have that uh, the, the spin is suddenly to follow a magnetic field in a completely different direction. Uh, yeah. So if you want uh, in a ring, uh, in a true ring, uh, the magnetic field is changing smoothly yeah. from one point to the other. While when we are doing this uh, with, the, with the polygons, we have a point where there is a, a sudden change of the orientation of the, of the magnetic field due to the spin orbit coupling. And the spins are forced to, to make a complete change at all, at all the vertices. But the beauty of the approach is that by increasing a lot the number of vertices, we are somehow able to smoothen this, uh, this, this constant jump that uh, the electrons has to do to all the vertices. And in the end of the day, really, we recover all, 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 the, all, all the estimation that have been for the, for the continuous case of, of rings. OK, now I get it. Thank you. OK. Further comments, questions from the audience? If not, I have I have another question. Um, you showed these results with the um, 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 well, you have the I think it was the conductance where in the case of the Zeeman field and uh, the Rushba spin orbit interaction and then you showed that with this order the periodicity is doubling yes and um and you mentioned that this is an, a known effect um can you explain it a little bit to me for me it's it's rather surprising that the periodicity is doubling with, with uh, well this, uh, this is well known for the case of uh, of, the, of 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 a party uh, an interferometer with a magnetic field I mean, okay. actually, this, sorry, this is a, a well known for the case of the of the weak localization. So, if you study ah, disordered okay. system in the presence of magnetic field, you know that you are expecting uh, ah, some periodicity okay. that is going mm -hmm. as uh, uh, the the flux divided by the flux quantum. While uh, when we have uh, okay. well, uh, uh, let me remember how is it is. Uh, so, at some point, you can reach a, a, a regime in which uh, that there is a doubling of those frequencies. And those yeah, are yeah, the Arnold Schuller uh, Spivak oscillations. And somehow in uh, mesoscopic rings, uh, you, you have a similar effect. Uh. I remember. Yeah. But, but again, th this is very simple. You can understand it because uh, somehow you can have uh, interference due to the direct paths. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is your Arnold boom. Uh, or you can have interference due to, to paths that are doing a complete turn inside your uh, interferometer. So mm -hmm. those are time reversed paths. Uh, and those are robust with respect to disorder, but now you are doubling the length of the length over which mm -hmm. each particle is moving, and this leads to this doubling of, of, of the of the frequency or halving of the frequency. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is it. Welcome. It was a nice picture we are picture asking for. Okay. Yeah. Other further comments? And again, just to clarify, clarify more, in the beginning of the history of those experiments in rings, people were working with just a single ring connected to two mm -hmm. bits. And clearly now, in that case, the results are, were completely random. So what you have to do, mm -hmm. you have to do many experiments, uh, changing a little bit the temperature. So in NITAS group, at some point, they started to engineer networks mm -hmm. containing up to 25 rings. But this was still quite messy. And then they, they, they managed, uh, I don't know how, to be things with uh, more than 2,000 rings uh, 
on a single sample. And I mean, for me, this is something that yeah. I find it completely uh, amazing. Yeah. How do you know how large are these structures? Uh, so the radius uh, is going up to one micrometer. Ah, okay. And this is made on a, a, in a semiconductor? It's a, or? it's a semiconductor, indium arsenide, uh, something. Uh, I mean, a semiconductor okay. where you have a good control of the spin of yeah. the interaction. And that, in principle, uh, where the, the mean free path is also very large, yeah. so you can be in your nice mesoscopic regime. And all the experiments were usually run at uh, 1.7 Kelvin. Yeah. I see. Yeah, it's very, very nice results. And yeah, um, further comments, questions from the audience? Sure. If this is not the case, Dario, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. Pleasure for us to have you here the next time in person in, in Mexico. Yes, I would yeah. enjoy, especially now that you tell me that it's not uh, in the, in the county in Mexico City. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Cuernavaca is a nice, uh, it's a rather nice place to visit. So um, uh, Alexander von Humboldt named it 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 once uh, the city of eternal spring. Yeah. And, and it's, it's quite true. So we have almost all the year about 25, 23 degrees sunshine. So about the weather, you cannot complain there. This is... <laughs> so it's the opposite of San Sebastian where it's raining uh, almost once a week. <laughs> and Maybe. we had last week 40 degrees and then after a few days we had that 20. Yeah. <laughs> These changes are not, not happening there. So... Okay, so it will be a pleasure you. to come yeah. to, to visit you in the place of Eternal yeah. Spring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Maybe, yeah. Thanks okay. a lot for the meeting. And thank you for joining us. Yeah. Bye bye. See you bye next bye. week. Bye bye. Have a nice day in Mexico and a nice yeah. evening in Germany. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye.